you have your Bibles, kindly turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. We started Genesis 11 last time. We'll continue where we left off, Genesis chapter 11. So last week, if you remember, we spoke about the Tower of Babel. We talked about how it was a post-flood rebellion, a post-flood rebellion carried out by Noah's descendants. And um, it was fueled, it was fueled by pride. They were armed with pride and they said, let us make a name for ourselves. They didn't want God in the equation. They wanted to make a name for themselves. And so they began to build a city. They began to build a tower that they wanted to observe uh, the world from the heavens from. It was all, you can also call it a ziggurat. So it was a kind of uh, special structure. And sometimes some people in those cultures refer to that as the gateway to heaven. So they built this, but the primary purpose of building all this was to make a name for themselves. But they were also disobeying God by when they did this because he told them, he gave them a commandment to fill the earth, which obviously means they have to spread out and go to the ends of the earth if they want to be obedient. But these people in the plain of Shina are also known as Babylon. They gathered together, they coalesced, they, they united and they built this place. So God says, come, let's go down there. And then he comes and he confuses their language. He confuses their speech. So he doesn't destroy them like he did during the time of the flood. There wasn't a flood. He promised never to do that again. So he doesn't punish them in that way. But what he does is he confuses their language. So Babel explains why we have so many languages in the world today. Now, the evolutionary worldview will suggest that, I mean, if you think about it, they said they would suggest that if we all evolve and all the languages that we have today can be traced back to one original language. But language experts and researchers will tell you that that's not the case, that there's actually a number of parent languages that we get all our languages from. It's not just one single language. And, and that, that's, all, that's a result of what happened at Babel, that God comes down, he confuses their language, and then from there they you know, spread all over. And this, this would have obviously happened because they decided to, you know, they started this huge massive building project, the city, this tower. Now God comes and confuses them by giving them, he creates this language barrier by giving them a multiplicity of languages. They would have got frustrated, they quit, they abandoned their building project, and they were scattered all over the earth. So as a result of Babel, the people spread, and the genetic pool became increasingly isolated. When I'm talking about, when I say genetic pool, all I mean is a collection of genes or genetic material at any given time when it comes to a people group or a particular spe uh, species. So it became more and more isolated, meaning some characters, characteristics, some physical traits became predominant in certain areas. And you can, you, if you just take, for example, skin tone or skin color, we know that skin tone comes from that pigment known as melanin. The more melanin you have, the darker your skin tone is. Actually, there are two forms. One is eumelanin, one is pheomelanin. Eumelanin is when, if you have more, and it all depends on the ratio of eumelanin and pheomelanin. So if you have uh, more of this eumelanin, then your skin tone will be somewhere between light brown to dark brown. If you have more of pheomelanin, then, then your skin tone will be somewhere between uh, red and yellow skin tone. So you have lighter skin over there. So it's all about pigmentation. Now, what determines our skin tone? It's largely to do also with where we live and where our ancestors live, because the people who are closer to the equator often have darker skin. And this skin, so which means more melanin, it protects them from the harmful radiation of the sun, 
there's more intense sunlight near the equator, therefore helping prevent things like skin cancer. And um, the people who have lighter skin usually live in higher latitudes, away, slightly away from the equator, because they need to absorb, they need more absorption of vitamin D. So, you know, accordingly, people moved and they spread all over the earth. And that would be one example. That would be one example of, you know, what happened after Babel, after God confused the languages. So this is a little bit, just a little bit explanation about how we, we get our different skin color. And as a result of Babel, everybody went. And so different people settled in different regions and some physical traits uh, that were favorable continued as part of that race because see today we say we say things like we we refer to different people as races we say caucasian race this race that race all those different races we talk about it but re the reality is there is only one race and that is the human race and so these are all div divisions ethnic divisions that we have come up, we have come we have uh, put together based on physical traits based on culture based on the area that a person lives but the reality is, according to the book of Genesis, we all come from one race, the human race. But uh, after Babel, people spread around. And um, depending on the region that they lived in, because of the genetic pool, became more and more isolated. Certain physical traits became more and more um, uh, predominant, you can say. So now, we're going to pick up in verse 10 because he's going to start talking again about Shem's line, one of the sons of Noah. Um, so you can say from Gen Gen Genesis 11, 1 to 9, the Tower of Babel, God in his mercy prevented something bad from happening. Who knows what would have happened if they got together. Sin again um, would have reached an all-time high. They might have been a tyrant. They might have been a ruler, one guy, one language. Uh, everybody uh, listening to him. God somehow comes in his mercy and confuses the language. And I was just thinking, as you read this, even today, we should be grateful during, uh, for those times rather, where God comes and maybe, you know, just to put it across lightly, gives us that uh, gentle shove that we need sometimes so that, you know, he corrects our course, our trajectory. We sometimes we're headed in the wrong direction. And, and in his mercy, he comes and he corrects our course, just like he did for the people in Babel, where he helped them carry out the commandment that he originally gave. You know, they had their own plans. They decided to come together. And so we must be grateful for those times where God does correct our course out of love because he disciplines those he loves. The New Testament tells us, the book of Hebrews tells us, and so when we look back, yeah, yeah, we're grateful for all the times that God disciplined us, all the times that he corrected our course. And now we're going to move on from verses 10 onwards to the line of Shem, one of Noah's sons. Because this line, this line is very important because we'll see where it leads. So let me read a couple of verses. I'm starting in verse 10 of uh, chapter 11. It says, these are the generations of Shem. When Shem was a hundred years old, he fathered Arpaskad two years after the flood. And after Shem lived, after he fathered Arpaskad five hundred years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpaskad had lived thirty five years, he fathered Shela. When Arpaskad lived, after he fathered Shela four hundred and three years and had other sons and daughters. When Shela had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shela lived and he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ryu. And Peleg lived he, and after he fathered Ryu. 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ryu had lived 32 years, he fathered Serug. And Ryu lived after he fathered Serug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nehor. And Serug lived after he fathered Nehor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nehor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. 
and Nehor lived after his father Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nehor, and Haran. One thing that you probably will realize as I just read that out is that the lifespan of people is rapidly decreasing. You start off with this guy called Arpas Kad. He says that when he was 35, he fathered Shela. He'll, after he fathered Chela, he lived for 403 years. Fast forward down and come to verse 24. Nehor lived 29 years. He, he lived only 119 years after he gave birth to uh, or after he fathered Terah. So the lifespan of people is rapidly decreasing after the flood when you just look at these few generations that are mentioned uh, over here. Then another thing is that Shem... This is the line of Shem, as I mentioned earlier. This is also the Messianic line. And it's mentioned for us again in the book of Luke chapter 3. The same names, Luke chapter 3, if you turn there, you will see all these names mentioned again because it leads straight up to um, the Messiah, Jesus himself. Then we also realize that it is through this line, the Shemites or the Semites, that that promise made way back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 about uh, where God promises a deliverer or a rescuer will come and crush the head of Satan and in turn his heel will be bruised. That promise, the proto-evangelium, is coming to pass through this line, the line of the Shemites. And that's why they, they record it. So every time we read a genealogy, we are reminded of the fact that all this is historical and that it really took place. There are a lot of people, a lot of names over here, a lot of, uh, you know, but it's, it all goes to show how accurate the records are. So Genesis eleven twenty six at the end of this genealogy that is mentioned over here, we hear about a guy called Terra. And this guy Terra had lived for 70 years. He fathered, for the first time we hear this name, here it's Abraham. But of course, we know him as Abraham, and often even when you read Abraham, we'll say Abraham, because that's what we're used to when we read the Bible. We know him, and that's how that God changes his name, and God does that to few people in the Bible. He changes their name. So first time we hear about Abraham over here, Abraham is mentioned 312 times in the Bible in 272 verses. So He's definitely a popular figure, arguably the most popular figure in the Old Testament. Um, maybe Moses is number two, you can say David number three. But Abraham is definitely, and he's not only popular in the Judeo-Christian worldview, he's also popular in Judaism, he's also popular in Islam. So he's also known as, you know, the the, the fame, he, he's an exemplar of faith, no doubt, but also He's called often the friend of God. I can three times at least in the Bible he's called the friend of God. Once in James two twenty three, I think, and two other times in the Old Testament, one Chronicles twelve, and I think in Isaiah he's called the friend of God. And that's a, that's a, that's an amazing thing to be recognized by. An amazing description of a person, a friend of God. It's always helpful to have friends in high places, and I mean. Having God as your friend is the as a person in the highest place. You know, God is in the highest place, and the, you can't have a more influential friend than God, a more powerful friend, a more faithful friend than God Himself. A story is told of Abraham. Since we're talking about Abraham, a story is told of Abraham Lincoln, the American president, during his time, during his rule as president. There was this one soldier in the army who was not a very loyal soldier. And uh, he let down his army men. He abandoned them somewhere. And so he was dishonorably discharged. And the penalty was death. They wanted to put him to death. So he was seeking a pardon. Only the president had the power to pardon him. And uh, this guy had no friends. The soldier had no friends. Absolutely no friends. And uh, that fact was made known to the president. So Abraham Lincoln said, I'll be his friend. And I'll pardon him. Always helpful to have friends in high places, influential friends. At that, at that point, in that moment, that season of his life, that soldier probably didn't need any other friends. You asked him, you want any friends? He said, only, only if Abraham Lincoln is my friend in that season, it's enough for me. Because he's the only one who has the power to pardon me and forgive me of the 
crime that I committed of being being disloyal to my uh, friends or camaraderie. So uh, it's always helpful to have, and we always helpful to have a friend in a high place, and we have the privilege of having God as our friend. Yes, he is our king, and yes, we are his slaves, but he treats us as friends. That, that's the message of the New Testament. So it's amazing to, to know that the first person in the Bible and the, the person uh, to receive that title is none other than Abraham. And uh, he's also an exemplar of faith. He also, you know, we learn a lot of lessons from him. He's, a, he's no doubt an important figure because if you look at the book of Genesis, it covers something like 2000 plus years of history. But one third or even more than one third of the book focuses just on this one man. It covers like 20 generations from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Genesis. 20 generations are covered, but one third of the book is about Abraham. So he's a very, very important figure and, you know, a lot of text, a lot of ink spilled uh, writing about Abraham and about his life. And so we learn a lot of lessons, you know, over the next few weeks, we will be looking at his wife. I mean, his life and of course his wife. And also we'll be looking at his son and his grandson, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and of course, Joseph. These are the main characters of the book of Genesis. And from, from this point on, it's going to be about them. Verse 28 of chapter 11 says, or I'll start with 27. Now, these are the generations of Terah. So now we come to this guy called Terah, who's the father of Abraham. Now, these are the sons that he had. He had three sons. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Now, most of us know Lot and his story and what happened to his wife. And all. So he was Abraham's nephew. Lot was Abraham's nephew. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred in Ur, in Ur of the Chaldeans. When it says he died in the presence of his father, according to some Jewish, maybe legend, maybe true, I don't know. But according to Jewish tradition, this, what happened is, they were all idol worshippers. He comes from a background of idol worshippers. Terah did. Abraham did. So there was a point where Terah said to Haran, one of his sons, to bow down to the god of fire, and he, he disobeyed. And so Terah then set fire to him and killed him instantly. So in that sense, he died before his father. So literally, like literally before his father, you know, he was a, in front of his father, he died. He died before his very eyes. That is one way of understanding it. The second way is people say chronologically. That is, his father was still alive and he died before his father. So it could go either way. I don't know what exactly this phrase means, but it more, in my opinion, most probably chronologically. I don't know, because that's only according to the Jewish tradition. It may or may not be true. Verse 29, And Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai. Sometimes people say it means contentious. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milka, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milka and Iska. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. I think that um, during this time, it was not only just, you know, like the normal shame or the stigma that came from being barren, because during these days, especially, even now, maybe to an extent, but not like how it was in these days, where if you don't have a child, people really look down upon you, especially in a polytheistic society where if you have children, that means you're favored by the gods, little g gods. And if you have many children, then you're highly blessed. You're highly favored. And in that time, in that shame and honor culture, Sarai was barren. And in fact, there was a, there's a Jewish, a Jewish saying where uh, the rabbis, one rabbi especially, one ancient rabbi used to say that there are seven people that are excommunicated by God. The first one is a Jewish man who does not get married. The second one is a Jewish man who does not, who gets married, but does not have children. So it was really looked down upon during um, that time. And of course, to, you know, I mean, even if you look at Leah, 
when Leah, I mean, we're, we're fast forwarding a little bit. Leah, when she had a child, she said, because she named the child and she said, because God looked upon my affliction. So it was an affliction to her. And when she, when God gave her a child, she said, because God looked upon my affliction. When that happened, Rachel immediately, you know, grabs Jacob and says, give me children or I die. So you, we, all those statements give us an idea of how desperately people wanted to have children, how it was looked down upon if they did not have children. And uh, to add to, to add to all the problems or the, you know, to make matters worse, Abraham, as once I mentioned before, and some of you know, his name means father or exalted father. So you can imagine, you know, people introducing, you know, having a conversation with Abraham and saying, what's your name? And he says, my name is Abraham. Oh, father. So how many children do you father? How many children do you have? Your name is father. After all, how many children um, are you father too? And it would have been no doubt. It would have been embarrassing for him to say, you know, he's an older man now, you know, it's difficult for him to explain that he actually has no children. Sarai is barren. So it would have been a very uncomfortable situation for Abraham. But it's amazing because most of us know what God did through him. Or if not, all of us know what God did through him. And, and sometimes in life, it is like that because, you know, sometimes people come and ask us questions, maybe intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Either ways, it kind of pokes us or it kind of hurts us because they're reminding us of some lack in our life or something that, you know, reminds us of something painful or whatever. Or they, they come and they give you advice that they think is actually harmless, but in reality, it reminds you of something or it's, it's painful for you to receive that. I mean, re recently I was... Um, part of a conversation where uh, somebody asked my aunt and my uncle how many children they had and they have uh, they had two children they now have one daughter because their son went to be with the lord almost 15 years ago so I always you know I know what answer my auntie will give because I've heard her give the answer she says I have two children uh, one lives in Malaysia and the, the other lives in heaven so that's her way of explaining to people that one is going to be with the lord and it's, it's a creative way of answering the question. But I wonder, whenever people ask that question, whether it might just remind them again of their son. I'm sure they think of him every day. But when people ask, so like that, like that, there are many questions, not just about how many children you have if you're not able to have children. But there are many questions like that about life where people might ask something and it, uh, it might hurt you. And so that's how Abraham would have felt, but God had plans. And, and, and it's the same for each one of us. God has his plans. God has his timing. And we ought to just trust him, just like Abraham did. I mean, God did the impossible through Abraham. And so we just continue to look to him with eyes of faith, um, trusting him, trusting his plan for our lives. You know, people may intentionally do. Maybe they, they want to hurt as deliberately or they might sometimes many times people do it unintentionally they don't know that we are sensitive or touchy about a certain topic and they just say something but we are hurt on the inside the, 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 and the, the point I'm trying to make is that we continue to trust God because he's the God who sees everything he sees everything he knows everything and so we just continue to trust him and we give it to him and we leave it in his hands so uh, yeah, so Sarai was barren. She had no child. Verse 31, Terah took Abraham and his son and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son, Abraham's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So he dies in Haran. They were supposed to go to Canaan, but they stopped short. They, they cut short the journey and they stopped in the border of Mesopotamia in Haran. So um, I think, sorry, I got distracted because I was getting a call. So I think it's important to note that um, they stopped in Haran because if you, 
the the call that came to Abraham from God came to him when he was in Ur of the Chaldeans. It didn't come to him when he was in Haran. It came to him when he was in Ur of the Chaldeans. And and uh, if, in fact, let me just turn the Acts chapter seven because this is the Holy Spirit speaking through Stephen. So it's very accurate. If you go to Acts chapter seven, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it out for you. Acts chapter seven, verse two. Stephen speaking in front of the Sanhedrin before he gets stoned to death, dies, at, dies as a martyr. And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. So often a way when you address the Jewish Sanhedrin, you call them brothers and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he, before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. So, and of course it says after his father died, God removed him and said, go to the land and all that. But the, the point that I'm trying to show all of us here is when you look at the text, there was only a partial obedience from Abraham because God told him, number one, leave your family. I mean, it might sound harsh in the beginning, but God is basically, he wants, he has a plan for Abraham and he wants to call him out of his family. And he says, leave your family, leave them behind and go to the place that I'm calling and the place that God was calling him was Canaan. But he goes and he stops short. He stops at the border of Mesopotamia, doesn't go into the land of Canaan. And he lives there close to 15 years until his father, Terah, dies. And again, there's this, there's this, story of how of course they were all idol worshippers that see there's a story of how his father was reading on the jewish virtual library is basically an online encyclopedia that there, there's a story of how his father actually made idols for a living abraham's father Terah. and there's also a story of how uh, abraham one day was so fed up with all those idols you get all this in the jewish online library that he took a hammer and he broke all the smaller idols, you know, going up to the big. And then finally, there was one large idol left. He broke, he smashed all the small idols. That one large idol, he put the hammer, you know, near the, you know, made that large idol, placed it in the hand of this very big idol. Father comes back, he's enraged by what he sees. He asks Abraham, what happened over here? He said the large idol had a fight with the smaller idols and he broke all the idols. And the father said, don't be ridiculous. How can an idol go? Then, you know, that's where Abraham confronts him and says, if you only know that all these idols are powerless, why do you worship these idols? If you believe it's impossible for this large idol. There's a story like that. I don't know how far it's true, but it's not mentioned in the Bible, of course. But it is mentioned that they were idol worshippers. In Joshua, I've written it down. I think Josh, yeah, Joshua 24.2. It talks about how um, Abraham's family, where he came from, they were all idol worshippers. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 35, 34 and 35, towards the end of 34 and the beginning of 35, it says even when Jacob, his uh, grandson, goes back to the relatives of Abraham's relatives, they still, they're still worshipping uh, idols. So that is an established fact. So let me go back to Genesis. So when he when there's only a partial obedience on Abraham's side, Terah is still leading the family. God has already called him according to Acts 7 2. And if you look at the beginning of chapter 12, God has called him and said, Go to the land, leave your family. There's a partial obedience. And because of this, there is a delay. As a matter of fact, in all these places like Terah has a meaning, the name Terah has a meaning, the name um, the place that they were in Haran has a meaning. The word Terra, many people say, means delay. The name Haran means either bitterness or barrenness. And that's, the, and that's interesting, right? We mean delay and barrenness. And very often, God calls us to do something and there's only partial obedience. You can say that's, that's the equivalent of disobedience. And when there's partial disobedience and not full surrender, there will be delay. And our lives won't be fruitful. The, op the opposite of, uh, or yeah, it won't be fruitful. We won't be very productive. We can't, do, we can't accomplish 
uh, as much as we want to for the Lord when there's only partial obedience, when there's no there's no wholehearted surrender. Because he did some things, he left he left over of the Chaldeans, but then he stuck in the border one foot here, one foot there. He's stuck over there. His father is still leading. God said, leave your family. He's still with Lot. He's still with his father. But you have to you have to understand also that Abraham came from a very difficult background. We know that he lost his brother, Haran, also named Haran. He lost, uh, he, he didn't lose, but he, he eventually loses his father as well. But he, his wife is bad and we know the shame. And he comes from this background, not a very strong spiritual background. It's the family that are all idol worshippers. So he's also had quite a rough upbringing. And yet God chooses him and God says, I'm going to make you great. And that starts in chapter 12. And maybe we'll read maybe the first three verses, first four verses, and then we'll stop. So now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country. Actually, if you read it in some translations, it'll be in the past tense. You know, it, it, it'll say God had said to Abraham, which is actually more accurate because God had said to him when he was in awe of the Chaldeans, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will, notice the number of eyes over here. This is God speaking. It says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, um, there are like about, yeah, I think four different things that God tells him over here. The, the very fact that God says, I will, I will, Yes, we often must reflect and we must think of all the things that we're doing for God. We just talked about it maybe a week or two ago about being a living sacrifice in accordance to Romans 12, 1 and 2. But um, we can only do, we can only live, be a living sacrifice because of all that God has done. And that's how, that's how the chapter starts. If you remember, it says in light of God's mercies. That's Paul's summary of the first 11 chapters of Romans. Everything that God has done. When you take all that into consideration, we can offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. So even in this case, we love because God first loved us. He, you know, his plan, his action, his love for us. He is the initiator. He does it. He takes the initiative. Uh, he takes the responsibility, he moves towards us, he creates us, he, we are uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. And here he does a lot of things for Abraham. He knows Abraham, Abraham's wife is bad and he knows he has come from a, you know, he's had a rough childhood, uh, very different from what Jewish people believe because Jewish people believe that he, he's a saint, he never sinned. Jewish people say according to their tradition that at the age of two, Abraham started serving the Lord faithfully and all those kind of things. We know when we read that he, he had a rough background, he comes from a background uh, background of idolatry and a polytheistic uh, worldview. They're worshipping many gods, you know, from the place where he comes from, Ur of Chaldees, the main god during the time, they had many gods. Main god was the moon god. So they worship the moon. It was a huge city, he's coming, for, he's coming out of this and God takes him and God uses him and gives him all these promises, I will make you a great nation. And you must, be, I mean, it, do, it does seem like God has a sense of humor because, you know, telling a man who's already advanced in eight years and, uh, and, a, and a man who has a wife who's infertile, telling him, I'll make you a great nation. But we know that it's true today because I think almost 15 million Jews worldwide. And that may, may not seem like... I mean, considering the world population, that may not seem like a huge number, but when you take the, the total Jewish population is less than, I think, 0.2% of the world population. And yet, as I, you know, some, I remember some weeks ago, I said almost 30% of the Nobel prices um, backed by the Jewish people. So they're, they're definitely a great nation and a lot of, Exports like uh, citrus fruit and flowers and all. They are some of the, the, their inventions, you know, all the things that they develop. So they're definitely a great nation. And it all started, this is the beginning of the nation. So in Genesis, from Genesis chapter 1, you have the formation of the heavens and the earth. 
then you have the fall of man and then you have the flood of noah and then you have the fallout at shinar or babylon where they rebel against the lord and now you have the formation of a nation a nation begins from chapter 12 onwards and it's going to get narrower and narrower all leading up to the messiah the lord jesus himself so we ought to be grateful to the jewish people uh you know uh, because if if not for them again romans 9 lists all the benefits that the jewish people had the tabernacle the worship the giving of the law the 10 commandments we wouldn't have we wouldn't have the bible if not for the jewish people because they wrote down you know they 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 listened to god all the prophets they recorded all these scriptures for us and of course we wouldn't have our messiah who is jewish so we should be grateful they are a great nation and also he said i'll make your name great you know like i mentioned earlier abraham's name is not only known in our judeo christian world with the jews consider him to be a very influential person they islam consider they, abraham is mentioned in their quran of course the story might be a little bit different it may not be isaac who was sacrificed it will be ishmael who was sacrificed but they also consider him to be a great man so his name also uh, became great even till today we sing father abraham had many sons and so his name is great and then all the families will be blessed through him i mean yeah so so many blessings come through the jewish people abraham was selected not just because like god had a soft corner for him and he he was special and so that's it he was selected so that he will be a blessing to all of us you know all the nations he will bless yeah he was selected to be an example as well the the nation of israel was formed so that they'll be a blessing to all the other nations and there is nothing great about them again if you look at deuteronomy i think 7 7 it says there was nothing uh, spectacular about the nation of israel god just chose them simply because he loved them and it's not that they could boast about their military prowess or anything nothing special about them. just the fact that god loved them and he set their effect he set his affection on them and so he gives them all these promises and maybe next week we'll pick up and see how he responded to these promises and what happens the journey will begin and we'll get into his life fully so that is genesis chapter 11 from verses 10 to 12 3